You know, we have a great privilege of living in a free country where we can worship freely our God, and so it's in his name that we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's word tells us that even as we worship him, we don't do so as perfect people, we do so as imperfect people. That's why we need him. We need the grace that comes from him. We need the mercy that comes from him, the forgiveness that comes from his son Jesus. And we have a promise that when we confess our sins, all that grace and mercy and forgiveness is ours by faith. And so we take a moment now to confess our sins as we do so. I'd invite you to kneel, or you can also remain seated where you are. Heavenly Father, we come before you today as people who need your grace, who need your mercy, your forgiveness, your salvation, because on our own and by ourselves, we don't measure up to your standards. We don't even measure up to the standards we set for ourselves. And so for all the ways that we fall short, for all the sins that we commit, sins in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, we confess them to you knowing that we can't deal with our own sin, only you can. And we thank you that you have chosen to deal with that sin graciously through your son, Jesus. For whatever sins we have that are troubling us in our hearts, we take a moment of silence to name them before you now. In Psalm 10, the psalmist says that God hears the cry of the afflicted, and he encourages them with his mercy. That is what we all need. We need encouragement from the mercy of God that does not treat us as our sins deserve. Instead, our God gives to us his son, Jesus, and on our cross, in our place for our sins, Jesus takes our sins so that we can receive the righteousness of God. Because of what Christ has done for you, you have the promise and the assurance that your sins do not define you. God's righteousness does. Because your sins have been forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Take away today. Let's sing it out. Who 
Now, on this whole subject of willpower, the sermon series, the preface, the premise for our, for our idea here is that you and I, we've grown up in a culture that says when you want to accomplish something, if you want to overcome something, work harder. And then they sort of changed that along the way and said, well, it's not just about working harder. Sometimes you can work hard and not accomplish what you need to. You really have to work smarter. But I'm here to tell you, dear friends, that when it comes to spiritual battles, when it comes to struggles with, with things that are raging in our, in our culture, sometimes the power that we need is not inside of us. And that's really where we're at. We're talking about the idea that our own willpower can only take us so far. We need more power than that. In fact, I love the line from the song we just sang, Who can stop the Lord Almighty? That's the power that we need. The power that held Jesus to the cross to take away our sin and the power that raised him from the dead, that's the power that you and I need in this life. So last weekend we talked about anger. We talked about how so many of us struggle with anger, or flying into a rage, being upset about things so easily in a culture that's epidemic with anger. We talked about how God can bring his power into our lives to help us resist that temptation to be angry people. You know, there's a, a description in Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about that feeling that you and I oftentimes have of helplessness when we're dealing with that kind of thing. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I, want to do, I, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Have you ever felt that way? You know what's right, you can't seem to do it. You know what's wrong, it seems like you're always slipping into that. You feel helpless, you feel trapped because our willpower is not enough. But Paul goes on and in verse 24 of Romans 7 he says this, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And then he gives the answer. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord that you and I have a place we can turn when we battle with anger. And that's important because today we're going to talk about an even more tender subject. We're going to talk about lust and sexuality. And I have to tell you the truth. It would be much easier as the preacher of this sermon to just skip this topic. Because <laughs> it's not easy to talk about. 
In fact, I feel like if I were a flight attendant, I would be saying to you, by all means, check your seatbelt, make, make sure it's low and tight across your waist, right? And if an air mask happens to drop down from the ceiling, by all means, put it on and take a deep breath. Because this whole idea of lust and sexuality is tough. And it's tough for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's tough because it's embarrassing. It's not something that we talk about all the time. It's not something we just simply share with other people. In fact, oftentimes we don't even talk about it with our own spouse. It's also a really tender subject because it's extremely personal and intensely private. And again, for that reason, we don't talk about those things very often. We don't talk them with very many people, and we certainly don't make it the subject of public conversation. But maybe the, the last reason is the most significant reason, that it makes it a really tender, really difficult subject, and that is because lust and sexuality are incredibly powerful. It's not like we can just sort of talk about that and it has no impact. Lust and sexuality are powerful in our culture and it's powerful in our lives. Now, the good news is we're not the only culture that's dealt with this. We're not the only society or, or people group that has struggled with this issue of sexuality and lust. In fact, it, it happens all throughout history. And so the place we're going to go to talk about it, to set the stage for this conversation, is in the book of Samuel. We're going to look at the life of King David. Now, remember who King David is. David is this, this young boy who grew up the youngest in his family, always the runt of the family, always got the worst jobs. But... When Samuel was told to anoint the next king of Israel after Saul, David is the one that God chose. In fact, you remember, they line up all the boys. They don't even call David in from the field because he's such a runt. There's no way it could possibly be him. But lo and behold, they, they get to the end and Samuel says, do you have no other sons? They said, well, we've got David. Can't be him. They said, bring him here. And sure enough, David is the one that Samuel is instructed by God to anoint to be the next king of Israel. David grows up and he's this, this young man who's faithful and honorable and noble. I mean, David is, is, is described as a man seeking after God's own heart. He is, he is the best of the best of us. And that's what makes what we're going to take a look at so difficult. Because David now, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says, In the spring when the kings march out to war, David sent Joab with his officers Joab with his officers and, in, and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. So when, when everybody else is headed off to war, David stays behind, but he sends out his army and they are victorious again. Now this is the thing that, that's sort of intriguing because David is not unaccustomed to military victories. He wins military victory after military victory. I mean, he, not only does he defeat the Ammonites, he defeats the Philistines, he defeats the Hittites. I mean, he is extraordinarily successful no matter where he turns. In fact, that's maybe one of the problems, right? Because when you and I experience success after success after success, it can get into our head, right? We can begin to think to ourselves, you know what? I'm too big to ever fail. I'm too important to ever fail. I've got too much whatever to ever fail. And you get the idea that that might be going, what's going on with David because it says here at the end, David remained in Jerusalem. And the thing that we discover is that, that David doesn't just remain in Jerusalem. That he's kind of kicking back. I mean, his army is, is fighting. They're at war, and he's lounging around. And that's where the text continues. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. Now, here's what I'm talking about. So, it's not evening as in bedtime. David is already lounging around on his bed. The evening comes before bedtime, and he decides he's going to get up and, and just kind of stroll around on the, on the roof of the palace. So, the palace, of course, is higher than every other building. So, he's just strolling around. You know, he's been laying around all day doing nothing. His armies have been out fighting battles for him. He gets up and he starts looking around. Ooh. He sees this beautiful woman. 
What's fascinating is that the word for, for very beautiful is the same word that's used in Genesis for very good. So in, the, in Genesis, after God creates all of the different parts of creation, and remember, he sees them and he says, it is good. We get to the end of the creation story, and it says, God saw all he had made, and it was very good. Bathsheba is very good. And is there any surprise? God created her. In fact, it also describes David as being very good, very beautiful in the Scripture. See, the problem isn't with with something that God creates being beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. It's what's going on in our hearts that's the problem. It's what's going on in our minds that creates the issue. In fact, we need to be clear about something. On this topic of lust and sexuality, the reality that there is attraction and desire between men and women, that's not the problem. That's not the issue. That's part of God's design. It's part of his creation. It's part of his purpose and intent. It's when it gets twisted. It's when it becomes manipulated. It's when it turns to sin in our lives. In fact, James chapter 1 kind of describes this process. See if it doesn't make sense to you. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, gives birth to death. So in other words, the desires, our own sinful desires coming from our own sinful nature, that gives birth to temptation. Temptation leads to actions that are sinful, and those sinful actions lead to nothing but death and destruction. That's why it's no surprise what happens next in this story with David. David's looking out, he sees Bathsheba, he says, that woman is very beautiful. And so the text says, so David sent someone to inquire about her. And he said, isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Iliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, at this point, you would think that that David would come to his senses. Number one, this is a married woman, right? Right? David knows the law. He knows what happens to people who commit adultery. He knows God's commands. And so you'd think that right off the bat, David would say, wait a minute, I shouldn't be doing this. But he continues. Not only is it a married woman, this is the wife of Uriah. So Uriah is one of David's soldiers, one of his troops. So his troops are out fighting a war on his behalf, in his name, winning victory for him. And you'd think that David would say to himself, wait a minute, I owe some respect and some honor to these men who are serving me. And you'd think that would shock him into realization, saying, you know what, I'm all wrong here. I've got to do something different. But it doesn't. But there's one other little detail you need to understand. Uriah is not just one of David's troops. He's not just one of David's soldiers. Uriah is one of the soldiers that has been with David all the way back to when he was a young man. He goes all the way back to the time when David was being pursued by Saul. So not only is this one of his troops, one of his soldiers, this is also a man that has has fought for him and stood next to him all of his adult life. This man is not just a, a soldier, this man is his friend. And you would think that that might just jolt David and say, wait a minute, this is a boundary I will not cross. But the problem is, lust is powerful, incredibly powerful. And it's taken hold. And it's blossomed into sinful action. And you begin to get a sense of just how deep this betrayal really is. The text goes on. David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to him, he slept with her. Dear friends, what I want to do in these last minutes, I want to talk about five things related to battling lust, battling these, these desires inside of us. I'm calling it guarding against lust. And, and I really want you to write these five things down. Because if we think anger is epidemic in our culture, struggle with lust and sexuality is, is ultra, uber epidemic. 
And the thing is, you, there are people in your life, you or someone you know, someone close to you is battling with this issue. They're struggling with this issue of lust or sexuality. Now the thing is, I don't want you to write these down and then just start having a conversation at the water cooler, right? This is a little different than usual. But I want you to have these things written down and pray that God will open the door with someone that you love, someone that trusts you, so that you can speak to them about something that's so intensely private, but when they talk to you about this, you'll have something to share with them that's biblical, something from God's Word. So are you ready? Point number one in guarding against lust, get some accountability. Dear friends, every single one of us needs an accountability group. Not just a few of us, not just, not just we knuckleheads. Every one of us needs an accountability group. We need people around us. And I'm talking about two or three. I mean, it can be larger, but it begins to be kind of unwieldy at some point. But even just two or three people who gather with you and who talk to you, people that you trust, you know that they are committed to you so that you can share the truth about the, the darkest things, the struggles in your life, and you know that they're not going to tell anybody else. They're going to hold that in strictest confidence out of love for you. And you also know that instead of turning their back on you when you struggle, they're going to they're get closer. They're going to shoulder in next to you and, and they're going to pray for you and they're going to help you stay on track and move in the right direction. We all need an accountability group. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, it says, though one may be overpowered. So in other words, one person by themselves, the devil is a master at tactics. He's a master at beating us. One person can be overpowered. Two can defend themselves. But a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You and I need an accountability group around us to help us. But I also want to give you two things that are absolutely essential. If you're going to be part of an accountability group, if you're going to be an accountability partner, there are two things that must, must, must be true. Number one, you tell the truth. If you're in an accountability group and you lie, it's not going to work. It's not going to help you one bit. You've got to trust the people in that group enough that you will tell them the truth, that when they ask you questions, because accountability partners ask hard questions, they talk about temptations, they talk about patterns, we talk about things that are real in our lives, places of struggle so that we can come together around those issues and help one another. So you've got to tell the truth, and that means you've got to trust those people to never betray your confidence and to always stand with you, even if they don't like it. But the second thing that's equally important, if you're going to be an accountability partner, you must be courageous. Because when someone in that group, I mean, these people are going to become friends. These people are going to become part of your life. You're going to depend on them and love them and care about them. And when you begin to be in that accountability relationship and you begin to see something going wrong in the life of your friend, there's going to be a tension inside that says, man, if I confront them, if I call them out, they're going to be mad. I might lose this friendship. Our families might not hang out together anymore. And you're going to feel a real sense of risk. And if you're going to be an accountability partner, you've got to have courage enough to step into that dangerous place out of love for your brother or your sister to say, wait a minute. You're going the wrong direction. And I love you too much not to say something. You've got to be honest and you've got to be courageous. Point number two when it comes to, to guarding against lust, don't think it can't happen to you. Don't ever convince yourself, don't ever believe the lie that says you're strong enough or you're, you're tough enough or you're disciplined enough that it can never happen to you. One of the ways that I've seen people struggle with all kinds of different sin over and over again is that on one moment they're saying, that'll, that'll never happen to me, I'll never struggle that way, I'm never going to have a problem with that temptation, and the next thing they know, they're looking in the mirror saying to themselves, how did I get here? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. What that means? If you think that you have got something on lockdown in your life spiritually, think again. I mean, remember, the, the enemy that we have, 
He's been at this a long, long, long time. He's good at it. He's mastered pulling strings. He's mastered pushing buttons. He's been watching, and he understands what we're like. He understands our weaknesses, and the reality is he is a master tactician when it comes to pulling us away and leading us into temptation because he wants death and destruction to reign in our lives. You and I should never, in arrogance, say, I've got this. I'm, that's not, I'm never going to have a problem with that spiritually because it's simply not true. You and I need to take heed of where we think we are standing strong because we're likely to fall. Instead, we've got to turn to a place where we find power. And that brings us back to our God. See, we don't have power enough, but what can stop the Lord Almighty? Nothing. Nothing. That's why we humble ourselves and we count on our God. Point number three, we've got to create good guardrails. Now, you know what a guardrail is, right? Guardrails when you're driving through the mountains and you're you're going around that curve and it's that drop-off. And if your car slips or, or something goes wrong, even if you go off the road, you've got a guardrail. It may mess up your car, but it'll keep you from going over the edge, right? You and I need to have good guardrails in our lives. We need to have places where where we have protection because when it comes to this issue of sexuality, when it comes to the issue of lust, Paul doesn't say fight hard. He doesn't say battle on. What he says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, listen, flee sexual immorality. Now think about what that means. He's not saying fight the good fight. He's not saying saying stand strong and and defend yourself. He's saying run away. This is so dangerous. This is so powerful. Run away. Get away from it completely because God knows lust and sexuality is powerful. And when it's used the wrong way, when it becomes distorted or twisted, it's still incredibly powerful and incredibly destructive. So we need guardrails. You know, I, I was reminded of this last night, literally. So Julie and I were at a wedding of one of our members. It was a beautiful wedding, a wonderful celebration. And when we were leaving, we were waiting for our car. It was one of those spots where they bring the car, you know, and and people are getting out and other people are getting in their car. And as we were waiting there for the car, a a, a woman pulled up, a a man and a woman, and the woman was getting out of her car. And you know that when when a woman's getting out of a car in a dress, it's a vulnerable moment. And so I have two choices. Either watch and take advantage of that vulnerable moment or listen to the voice of my dad. My dad must have said to me a thousand times if he said it once, when you see a woman in a vulnerable position, avert your eyes. I mean, literally, look away. Look away out of respect. This this woman is your sister, This woman is is worthy of respect, so avert your eyes. And so in that moment, I averted my eyes because that guardrail protects me from going to a place of having thoughts of being engaged in something that's destructive for my life and destructive for my marriage. For me, one of the guardrails that's, that's important in my life is averting my eyes. You and I need guardrails like that because we don't simply need to fight Lust, we need to flee sexual immorality. By the way, Pastor Zach had a neat phrase this week. When we were talking about this, he said, you know, one of the things that we need to understand about morality is that morality is the difference between right and wrong. Wisdom is the difference between better and worse. You understand, God doesn't call us to lead lives that are simply right. He calls us to lead lives that are excellent, lives that are praiseworthy, lives that are honorable and noble, lives that are holy as he is holy. And so we need to exert the wisdom to have guardrails that protect us from immorality, but better than that, that lead us to excellence. Point number four. We've got to pour ourselves to guard against lust. We've got to pour ourselves into our marriage and into our family. 
Now, what do I mean by pour yourself into? I mean that, that we've got to devote ourselves to our spouse. If, if you're blessed enough to have a spouse, you've got to pour your life, your heart, you've got to pour yourself into your marriage. You know, in our culture, we get this all twisted around. We think that, that physical intimacy is the goal. That physical intimacy is the, is the be-all and end-all that we're striving toward in every relationship, including our marriage. And, and do you realize how messed up that is? That's not the be-all and end-all. Physical intimacy is supposed to be the, the expression, the, the intimate personal expression of all of the other intimacies in marriage. It's to be the expression of our vulnerability, the expression of our openness, the expression of our love and care, the expression of our tenderness in all of the other aspects of our life. And when it happens that way, then physical intimacy flows out of that healthy relationship. But when we get it messed up, it messes up everything else. I can't tell you how many relationships I know of where the physical intimacy is a mess because the other parts of the relationship are also a mess. Paul talks about that. He says, A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves in prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You and I struggle in that area of physical intimacy, but the fact is when it comes to marriage, that physical intimacy is supposed to be the thing that comes after all of the other intimacies are accomplished. By the way, that's why sex before marriage is such a disaster. Because it takes that last intimacy and it puts it first and it disrupts all of the other possibil possibilities of intimacy, of emotion and heart and mind. Now, I said we've got to pour ourselves into our, our marriage and our family. Here's the other thing. If you are a, a dad, if you are a mom, if you are an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or a godparent, you need to pour yourself into your family. You need to, to help to create those guardrails. You need to help to create those images. You know, when I, when I think about that guardrail, remember what I said whose voice was echoing in my mind? It was my dad. Because he said it to me over and over and over again. My dad poured himself into my life. He took the time to teach me all kinds of things beyond just the, the simple fatherly kinds of things. He taught me about what it means to love your wife because I saw him adore my mom and serve her as a faithful husband. He taught me what it means to respect a, a, a person of the opposite sex instead of seeing them as an object. Dear friends, we've got to be teaching our kids these things. We've got to teach them to respect marriage so that when they grow up, they respect their own marriage. See, when you and I take the time to pour into the lives of our family, we are investing in their future because we're helping to create the strength and the clarity and the dependence upon God that they need just like we need it. That brings me to point number five. We've got to turn to Christ. The devil is far too good, far too experienced. And by the way, he's not trying to tempt us into something fun or fulfilling. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't want to tempt us into fun stuff. He wants to leave your life in ruins. He wants to leave your marriage in ruins. He wants to leave your future in ruins. He despises you. He doesn't like you. He despises you, and he wants to ruin your life. And so instead of allowing ourselves to be drawn off by his temptations, we must turn to Jesus. We've got to depend on him. He's the one who has the strength, and he's the one who has the power. He's the one who defeated the devil every time he came before him. That's the power that we need. In fact, I love this passage. Psalm 73, verse 25. says, Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. Now, when you hear that, out of context, it sounds like some kind of hyper-spiritual mumbo-jumbo, right? 
Oh, who do I have in heaven but you? I desire nothing but you. It sounds like it's so spiritual that it's not of any practical value. But you've got to go on to verse 26. So who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. See, God knows something about you and me that we try desperately to forget. And that is that the clock is ticking. We're getting older. Life is racing by. You know, I remember Pastor Teske, when he was here a couple weeks ago, talked about how as he's getting older and older, it doesn't seem like it's sand through the hourglass anymore. It's like water through the hourglass, right? God knows that. And so what he's saying to us is, hey, listen, life is changing. You're getting older. There are more and more frailties. There are more and more weaknesses. There are more and more reality of sickness or death. The thing is, all the stuff that we convince ourselves make us strong and make us powerful and give us security, that stuff is fading away. And the only place ultimately that we can turn that will never fade away is Jesus, the power of our God. You know, it makes me think, as I was talking with the kids about the holiday season, we're headed in, we're a week away from the weekend before Thanksgiving. And that's kind of the official start of the holiday season, right? I mean, most schools have Thanksgiving week off. It leads us into Thanksgiving Eve, Thanksgiving Day, you know, Black Friday. I mean, we're off and running. And by the way, we have got an amazing Christmas season plan for you. In fact, you should mark down December 16th. You do not want to miss December 16th at Concordia because we've got this thing called Winter Wonderland. It's going to be an absolutely astonishing service. There's going to be all kinds of stuff out in the courtyards and, and outside. It's going to be, well, it'll be amazing. Mark it down. I'm getting off the track. I've got to finish this thing. So I love the holiday season, but what I really love is that it kicks off with Thanksgiving. Anybody else a big Thanksgiving fan? Yeah, how can you not, right? I mean, it's got football. Base requirement, right? It's got family. That's the, the icing on the cake. And it's got amazing food. I love the food of Thanksgiving. But here's the problem with Thanksgiving these days. I've been trying to, to you know, lose some weight and get more fit. And so that means smaller portions. So, you know, instead of, instead of being able to eat at Thanksgiving, you know, I sort of have to eat. And it's not that rewarding. But there is one redeeming grace. Leftovers. <laughs> Julie is absolutely the best at making sure that there's enough Thanksgiving dinner that there are leftovers. And I love to be able to go out. You know, you can go out and you can get the, the turkey. You can get stuffing. You can get potatoes and gravy. You can get, you know, maybe all of it, right? Because there's leftovers. Lust tells us that it's going to fulfill us. Lust tells us that it's going to give us everything that we want. Tells us if we can just do this, if we can just have that, that we're going to be fulfilled. It's going to make our life absolutely wonderful forever. And it's a lie. Lust does not fulfill us. It leaves us empty. Lust, as James describes, gives birth to sinful actions, and sinful actions lead to death and destruction. Now God, God promises to fulfill us, and he keeps his promise. That's why we have word pictures in the scriptures like God's, God being like living water flowing into our lives, and living water that literally flows into our lives and overflows and flows into the lives of other people. God wants to fill us, and he wants to fill us now, and he wants to fill us every day, and he wants to fill us for eternity. That's why in the story of the, the feeding of the 5,000, remember that they had five loaves and a few little fish, and they fed 5,000 people, but it doesn't end there. When they finished feeding 5,000 people with a few loaves and a few fish, then they gathered up the, the leftovers, and there were 12 baskets of it. See, what sin and lust, promise, is a lie. What God promises, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Because God always pours out his love and his grace and his provision, fulfillment in abundance. So I want to conclude by reading a verse together. 
is from John chapter 10, verse 10. Some of you probably have this memorized. But in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus is speaking. And he's speaking to us. And he begins by talking about the thief. Now, you know who the thief is, right? The thief is the devil. The thief is that master tempter. The thief is that one who's roaring about, ro roaming about like a roaring lion. He wants to devour us. He wants to destroy us. So he speaks about the thief, and then he speaks about himself. He says, I. So will you stand as we read this verse? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come. Dear friends, as you and I walk through this life, may we call upon the power of our God who blesses us and fills us to abundance. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your love, for your power. Lord, thank you that you called us to be your children. Bless us now as we go forward into our world. Strengthen us to live our lives by your power and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen. I sure hope this worship service has been a blessing to you. Thanks for joining us. If we can be of help to you in any way, be sure and send us an email at online at concordia.cc. For now, God bless you. I hope to see you.